అంతర్జాతీయ స్థాయిలో హైదరాబాద్ కేంద్రంగా ప్రపంచ పారిశ్రామికవేత్తల సదస్సు రెండో రోజు పలు ఆసక్తికర అంశాలపై వేదికగా నిలిచింది పారిశ్రామిక రంగంలో మహిళల భాగస్వామ్యంపై రెండో రోజున చర్చ జరిగింది ఈ చర్చలో యువాంక సలహా పలువురు మహిళా ప్రతినిధులు తమ అభిప్రాయాలను వ్యక్తం చేశారు ముఖ్యంగా సదస్సుకు ప్రత్యేక ఆకర్షణీయంగా నిలిచిన యువాంక ట్రంప్ తో మంత్రి కేటీఆర్ ప్రత్యేకించి మహిళ ఆర్థిక స్వలాభావంపై చర్చించారు మహిళలు అభ్యుదయం కోసం పాటు పడుతూనే పారిశ్రామిక రంగంలో విప్లవాత్మక మార్పులకు శ్రీకారం చుట్టాలని ఈ సందర్భంగా సూచించారు మహిళలు ఆర్థికంగా బలపడాలని ఆకాంక్షించారు is when you actually have to stay the course because as a as a mother of 3 two of which are daughters it's unbelievable how much of a role model you can be as a successful woman in helping them and their friends and the larger kind of community and being being successful you know candidly i'm actually quite optimistic about what is happening now in this area i think we all agree the numbers are not moving as fast as they need to to be moving but the amount of support that we are seeing in companies ceos um the the white house various other public and organizations in the support around putting getting more women into leadership roles and enabling that i think today is remarkable so um it's still tough i mean there's still a a um you know environment out there that is really conducive to um men candidly and i think through policy change through culture change through having great leaders step up and really want to change the game when it comes to this i'm actually optimistic that over the next couple of years we're going to continue to see some real moment momentum great great let me go to sherry um sherry for those of you who are uh, unaware mine is the famous surname she was a lawyer back in 1976 she started her own law firm and for the first time in the history of britain she was the first wife of a prime minister who had her own career i think that was the first time that has ever happened in british history so sherry how difficult was it to be in the limelight and also to have your own career and i'm sure there must have been a fallout there must have been a few issues that emanate from it so let's talk about it uh, and how difficult is it again to be in the spotlight again and to fight it out through your own career. Well, I think that uh, first of all one of the reasons I was the first spouse of a of a prime minister to actually have gone to university and that includes Dennis Thatcher who didn't go to university by the way. Um is just a generational thing. Um my predecessors if you like were of a different generation where girls ed- you know didn't get educated. In 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 fact um Dorothy McMillan the wife of Macmillan the prime minister actually so told her daughter that she shouldn't go to university and stop to going to university because she said all she needed to do was to know how to run a household so there's a there's a generational thing and a change in what what we expect from women uh what was it like uh, holding down a full-time job as well as uh, being married to the prime minister well i didn't think after 20 to 25 years in my own career where i'd work when i had three children under five when i was uh, essentially supporting my husband as he went on his political career why would i change my job just because he had changed his now this did cause absolutely <laughs> this did cause some consternation in 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 downing street because they basically expected me to be there to be the the, the hostess and the support and to be wheeled out on the the uh, occasions when it was required and i did all that by the way but one of the things that enabled me to carry on with my career actually was it because because by the time i got to um, downing street i was able to conduct my business through from downing street so i might be dealing with my legal papers i might be answering clients queries from my desk my client would not know where i was nor would they know that possibly half an hour before that i'd been down greeting the first lady of tanzania to have tea with her uh now i couldn't do that uh without it and that made a huge difference to me and it's why when i left downing street and i was thinking if it makes such a difference to a fortunate woman like me 
surely there must be opportunities for using IT to bring uh, advantages to women entrepreneurs across the world. And that's one of the missions of, of, of my foundation, which is to help women with what we see as the three C's that they need um, for growing their own business. And the three are, we've mentioned one already, confidence. Because too many women are told what they can't do, not what they can do. Uh, the second C is cap capability, capacity, it's training. It's, it's women, again, don't get the same access to education across the world as, as men do. Um, business is partly instinctive, but partly it's about knowing how to run things right, how to read a spreadsheet, how to build a business plan, how to make the right sort of pitch to get the sort of money that Chandra will then loan you uh, the whatever capital that you need. And the third one is access to capital. And capital is a big issue for women entrepreneurs, and I know there must be many of them in this room that know only too well that when it comes to getting the money to grow and expand your businesses, it's very hard to move the needle, to get beyond the skeptical, often male officers in the banks who don't actually really believe that a woman um, can succeed in business. And so we work with our women to build those things, and we do that by using technology. And finally, I'd say this, you know, if we're going to do anything in this world, we've got to do something about men. All right. Yeah, uh, that, 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 that includes you. Men need to, un <laughs> men need to understand that women are their equals. Men need to understand that, that women do face obstacles that they don't understand. And men need to understand that they need to do their share as well. I was uh, recently at the American Embassy in Delhi where we, we'd done a program with the American Embassy called We Can. And I know two of our women entrepreneurs who won that competition are in the room here. But we had a group of 25 Indian women entrepreneurs who came to present their business ideas. <clears throat> at the same time, the American Embassy had invited along some IT entrepreneurs that they had been working with, mainly men. <clears throat> and the women were talking about their obstacles, and yet one of the young men stood up in the audience and says, I don't understand what the, the, this woman is talking about. He says, sometimes when I go to, to um, an interview or to, 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 to seek a business, people ask me about whether I'm married, and you know, I don't find that offensive, so why are these women complaining that they can't get uh, any help and assistance because when they come there, all everyone is asking them about is whether they're married. And that just showed the women were, were very firm with him about there is a difference because for a man here, if they, you say you're married, people will think, oh, responsible, not likely, you know, got responsibilities, likely to be a good bet. For a woman here who's looking for capital and comes and they say, are you married? And she says, yes, I am. They think, oh, difficult, going to get pregnant, you know, got other responsibilities. So it's a completely different mindset. And unless young men, like the young men in those room, understand that, understand the difficulties that their, their wives and their sisters, and yes, their mothers are experiencing, then we're never going to change uh, this dynamic. Thank you, Sherry. In fact, you talked about... Sherry talked about three C's, capacity, confidence, capital. I think the fourth C today, Sherry Blair. Um, Ivanka, you are advising the leader of the free world. You have a unique opportunity to bring about a huge drastic transformation across the world, especially from the women's perspective that uh, Sherry so eloquently spoke about. In India, in Telangana, we do a bunch of things with the private sector as well. We do. We work with Cisco in a program called Women Rock IT. We also work with Microsoft, another US company, in what is called as Girls in Technology. We also work with Facebook in what is called as Boost Your Business. We work with ICICI and a bunch of private sector players. My question to you is, how can a government, be it the United States or India or any other province in India or across the world, how can a government ensure that we do more in terms of policies for bringing in more women into workforce, ensuring that they're skilled, and also how can we work with the private sector in ensuring that we give a, a larger share to women, which is what we've been talking about. Well, thank you, and, and thank you for having me here today on this remarkable panel. So much of what was said was deeply inspiring, and, and I agree with wholeheartedly. So 
One thing I'd just like to throw out there is these aren't women as issues. We're half the population. So we have to just start thinking about them Absolutely. as critical issues, not women's issues. So the role of strong male voices in this conversation, to Sherry's point, is very, very important. Also, going um, back to something else you said, Sherry, I think one of the reasons we're seeing an explosion of women's entrepreneurship is because traditional workplaces often haven't worked for us. We are disproportionately providing unpaid care while also needing to support our families financially. In the vast majority of American homes now, all parents work. So women are working, supporting their families, and providing unpaid care. And often, and you know, after, after years and years, generations, these cultural, social work institutions were not set up with the assumption that there would be two parents in the workforce. So we just have to fundamentally change things. It's starting to happen in the corporate world, albeit typically at larger companies, not smaller companies. It's a lot harder in terms of flexibility, traditionally for people in tech and in finance, making more money, um, not for women working um, at the lower income end of the spectrum. So I think that's where government policy comes in. And we need to start thinking about ways to support the modern workforce and the modern reality of dual income households. I think technology is a great driver of entrepreneurship because a lot of women are leaving and saying this doesn't work for me and it's emboldening them to go out on their own. Uh, technology is reducing barriers to starting new businesses. It's creating flexibility around schedule. So you were, can work just as many hours or more, but maybe you work some of them after you've put your child to sleep from your living room or from your kitchen table. So I think technology offer, offers tremendous opportunities to women and women entrepreneurs, and we're seeing that in terms of the explosive global growth and domestic growth we're experiencing in, in the United States. But, but going back to, to public policy, um, I think it's incredibly important we have policies that support the modern working family. You see in tax reform the expansion, the vast expansion of the child tax credit, recognizing the massive investment parents make into their families at a time when wages have stagnated for so long, um, and working parents really need relief. Um, the child and dependent care tax credit, tackling the cost of child care, and the fact that it's not only inaccessible in large portions of the country, um, particularly in rural America, but the cost is enormous to, to many American parents and they're unable to afford to provide high quality childcare. So that's another issue we're addressing. So you, you see some of that agenda coming to life through um, components of tax reform. And coming into the new year, um, you will hopefully see it in a national paid family leave program that we're working hard to build coalitions of support for. The president included it for the first time ever in his budget this year, um, paid family leave, maternity, paternity adoption. And, um, and I'm very, uh, encouraged by that step and we'll be working with Congress to try and pass what is a long overdue policy. So, so that's where you have public policy and many other things we're doing. Um, this is a panel focused on skills training and workforce development and we're really seeking to fuel that and make sure that we have the best trained next generation K through 12, rethinking what we're teaching and the alignment of what's being taught in the classroom with the jobs available in the economies into which the students are graduating, but also worker retraining and skills training for older workers whose jobs have been displaced or are looking for, for new opportunities in, in their own lives as well. So this is an area we've been very focused on and I can talk about in more detail if the conversation takes us there. But you'd mentioned the private sector and, and I can't say how important this is. I mean, it's really all innovation comes from the private sector. That's where it starts, that's where it originates. And government, and thank you to, to all of you out there and you incredible entrepreneurs who are taking some of the world's greatest challenges and obstacles, whether it's humanitarian aids or just providing a service better or reinventing um, or inventing a new idea. So it's, it's incredibly exciting what you're doing, but government's role is to help fuel that, to eliminate barriers, to create an environment in which you can 
really accomplish your, your dreams and your goals, and, uh, and we're seeking to do that domestically and, and very excited about the work we're doing internationally to create opportunities for, for entrepreneurs and women entrepreneurs, especially in the developing world. Fabulous. In fact, uh, <clears throat> let me compliment the Trump administration on, uh, as you said, as you put it, long overdue uh, you know, policy reforms, which are in the offing now, and I do hope Congress passes it, and I do hope uh, the Trump administration actually has a huge, uh, huge victory, especially in this very, very important sector. Um, Chandra, okay, uh, you have a very ambitious ICICI digital village outreach program. You've already uh, targeted 11,000 villages across 17 states, and out of which you've already created 7,500 women entrepreneurs. So what, what goes into ensuring that these women entrepreneurs in these villages from the rural settings, how are they empowered? How do you ensure that? I'm sure there must be obstacles in trying to bring them into the workforce. I'm sure there must be a lot of challenges. How, how do you overcome that? And how do you also ensure that they stay on top of their game? And how do, you, how do they keep uh, sustaining what they do? Uh, so let me take this in two parts. Let me also tell you what we do at ICICI to just encourage women participation in a large organization. And then let me tell you as, as our CSR, what do we do in the villages to encourage women uh, you know, in the rural areas. So in the organization, as I mentioned, we are an absolutely merit-oriented organization. And in fact, if people ask me, do you have special policies for women? We actually do not have real special policies for women. And I think the only special thing that we do is to create that environment where women feel confident that it's on the basis of their merit that they will rise. Fantastic. Fantastic. Having said that, we also realize that you know, at specific life stages, women need that special care so that they don't give up. And I'll just point out to a couple of policies that we've started. So we've started something called I Work at Home, where we allow women, you know, especially the young mothers, or even women who have to take care of their elderly parents or parents-in-law, to work from home for extended period. And this is not just about sitting and doing some data entry in some corner, but we create a work environment where through the use of technology, we have their computers linked online with our back-end systems. We have you know, face recognition so that we know that it's only the woman who's working. We have face recognition to say that if there's too much crowd around the woman and children are moving around, then the computer will shut off. So in a way, we create a real working environment where over long periods, people can work from home and they do not lose out on their career progression if they're working from home. Fantastic. Fabulous. Uh, the other thing that we've started lately is actually to say that any mother who's got a child up to three years of age, we, and if that mother travels overnight for office work, we of course pay for the mother because she's going for office work, but we also pay for the travel of the child and the travel of a caretaker so that the mother can take the child and take it away. Fabulous. Fabulous. Chandra. So these are, these are some of the things in an, in an uh, organizational environment. But coming to our skill training initiative, you know, we've started a whole skill training initiative across India. Uh, and through that, what we've done is we train those underprivileged youth who are not able to afford higher education. For that, we pick skills which are actually relevant for this kind of youth. So we have about 24 training centers in urban and semi-urban areas in the country, plus around 500 villages where we have taken the skill training initiative. The training skills that we've picked vary from something like a tractor assembly and a tractor repair to electricals to dress designing, garmenting, web designing, and office administration and selling skills. And what we have seen is that as we take these training skills, especially to the rural areas, we have more and more young women joining these training skills. So I'm very proud to say that we train about 100,000 youth every year, and of that, 55% are women. Fantastic. A big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. More than 55%. That's amazing. 
That's amazing. And, and, and this is what we were talking about before with, with really so much of the leadership happening in the private sector and government taking these great programs and fueling them and, and really bringing them to scale. So, you know, some of the most successful examples of skills training we've seen when we've looked across the globe at various apprenticeship opportunities are when government teams up with industry or government teams up with technical schools, community colleges, creates curriculum, and then that curriculum is taught to students, and then on the other side, they, they get a job from a, of a private sector employer. So really creating that ecosystem and making sure there's an alignment with the class classroom skills and a curriculum that will actually lead to a good paying job and a lot of it's outside of the traditional four year college track. I think in America we've gotten so focused on the importance of university that we've really done a disservice to a lot of people who could have had great paying jobs, who could have gone a different route, who could have learned skills um, and maybe had skills better suited to um, to the work that they wanted to do um, and would have benefited from, from technical education or apprenticeship and real on-the-job training. So I think there's a tremendous opportunity in what you're describing and 100,000 people a year. That's amazing. So. That's Thank exactly you. what my and, point was. And since you asked how do they stay mm -hmm. into it, you know, so what we do is we create courses where the content is such that it ensures them a livelihood. Uh, what we've done in the digital villages is that we've actually digitized a whole set of financial payment systems so that it becomes inclusive for people to actually carry on their financial transactions and not suffer.